late summer night 2001 an Airbus 330 A Transat 236 carrying about 293 passengers and 13 crew members on board was preparing for a transatlantic flight from Pearson International to Lisbon, Portugal. The aircraft was carrying about 46.9 tons of fuel, which was way more than what was required for the entire flight. At a 0052 UTC, the aircraft lifted off into the darkness, climbed smoothly and settled down on its eastbound course. Everything appeared to be pretty normal as Captain Robert and First Officer Doug stirred the aircraft towards the Atlantic Ocean. No one on board could ever imagine the harrowing ordeal that would unfold in few hours. Roughly about four hours into the flight, high above the mid-Atlantic Ocean, trouble has already started brewing invisibly. Unknown to the crew, a fuel leak had started at 0438 UTC from a fractured fuel line from a right side engine. The fracture in the fuel line was due to a maintenance error days earlier. During the right engine replacement, there was a mismatched installation of hydraulic tube and the fuel tube causing them to rub against each other. Due to high pressure, the fuel pipe ruptured causing the fuel to spray inside the engine compartment. Initially, the leak was too small to be noticed, but it was about to become a major threat. At a 0500 UTC, the first indication of the trouble appeared. The crew noticed that the readings of the oil pressure gauge of engine number 2, that is the right side engine, was not usual. The oil temperature was oddly low and the pressure was high. Though these values were outside the normal limit, but still within the safe limits, leaving the pilots puzzled. Captain and the first officer searched their manuals but found no clear cause. With no obvious malfunction indicated and no alarm from the Airbus's ECAM, they suspected a sensor glitch. They radioed the Air Transit Maintenance Control System Montreal to discuss the strange oil readings. The company engineers, equally baffled, had no better explanation. Their advice was simple to monitor the situation. At this point, the crew had no idea that these oil indications were being caused by the fuel leak. The leaking fuel was passing through a fuel oil heat exchanger, cooling the oil unusually fast and raising its pressure. But without a direct fuel leak warning system, the A330's computers offered no alert. The pilots focused on the perplexing oil problem, reminded blissfully unaware that the fuel was pouring out of their aircraft. Minutes later, around 0536 UTC, a new warning flashed, a fuel imbalance between the left and the right wing tanks. The right wing's fuel quantity was inexplicably lower than the left's. This was the first concrete indication of a fuel problem. However, instead of immediately consulting the written checklist, the pilots reacted from the memory. Captain Pitch had practiced fuel imbalance scenarios in simulators and believed that he knew the remedy by heart. He opened the crossfeed wall to connect the left and the right fuel tanks and turned off the right tank's fuel pumps, forcing fuel from the left wing to flow to the right wing. The goal was to rebalance the fuel load, unaware that they are feeding the leak. This action has actually proved catastrophic. Fuel gushed from broken line at about 13 tons per hour, now drawing from both wing tanks instead of just the right. In hindsight, this was a critical human factor error. By not checking the fuel imbalance checklist, the crew missed a caution note that would have warned them about a possible leak. Feeding the leak caused the available fuel to plump it rapidly. Within minutes, the total fuel on board fell well below what was needed to reach Lisbon. The seed of disaster, the unnoticed leak, had now grown into an emergency. By 0545 UTC, the situation was dire. The fuel remaining was now below the minimum required to safely reach Portugal. Captain Pitch made the urgent decision to divert to largest air base, a military airport on Tercera Islands in Azores, the closest land available. The crew notified Santa Maria Oceanic Air Traffic Control of a fuel emergency and the change of course, and Flight 236 headed on a direct path for Lages, still hundreds of kilometers away over open ocean. Knowing they might not make it to the land, the crew began preparing everyone for a possible ditching, which is water landing. At around 0600 UTC, Captain Pitch informed the lead cabin attendant of the low fuel emergency and the plan to land in Azores in about 40 minutes. When she asked whether to prepare for landing on ditching, Captain Grimly answered to prepare for a ditching in the ocean just in case. Flight attendants moved urgently through the cabin in darkness, instructing passengers on life vest and brace positions in English, French and Portuguese as some passengers silently prayed and cried. Around 0613 UTC, as Flight 236 was still about 150 nautical miles, that's roughly about 280 kilometers from Largis, the worst happened. The right engine flamed out due fuel starvation. In the cockpit, alarm rang. The captain and the first officer remained calm. The Airbus 330 could fly with one engine, but not for long with so little fuel left. Captain Pitch immediately initiated descent from flight level 390, that is 39,000 feet, 
to 33,000 feet, the optimum single engine altitude for their weight. They hope to stretch their glide and fuel as much as possible. At 0623 UTC, the first officer radioed the air traffic controller, urgently conveying that one engine had failed and fuel was nearly exhausted. Air traffic controllers sprang into action, cleared the path to latches, and advised the crew as they descended towards the island. By now, the flight 236 had only 600 kg of fuel, a few minutes worth flying left on board. The remaining engine strained to hold altitude. Exactly after 3 minutes later, that's at 0626 UTC, the unthinkable occurred. The left engine, that is engine number 1, flamed out as well. Flight 236 had lost all its engine power, still 65 nautical miles, that's roughly about 120 kilometers from the Azores. In an instant, the Airbus 330 became a 200-ton glider over Atlantic. The cockpit fell silent. Inside the cabin, emergency lights flickered on as the main electrical system died. We just lost our second engine, one of the pilots reported to ATC, warning them that they might have to ditch in the ocean. Despite this huge shock, the pilots focused on flying the aircraft. Captain Pitch took the controls as pilot flying, while the first officer handled communication and troubleshooting. Well, if you guys have seen my vlog on dual engine failure, you all know what a ram at turbine is and what it does. With both engines gone, the Airbus's automated systems responded. A small ram at turbine deployed a windmilling in the airflow to generate critical electrical and hydraulic power. This emergency power kept essential flight instruments alive and allowed limited control of aircraft's hydraulics. Even so, many systems were lost. The cockpit screens went blank except for standby gauges. Cabin pressure was no longer maintained and only one of the three hydraulic systems remained functional. The pilots now had to hand fly a heavy jet with the degraded controls. As the plane drifted down through 17,000 feet, oxygen masks dropped in the cabin due to loss of pressurization. And finally, a hopeful sign. Through the pre-dawn darkness, the crew spotted a faint glow on the horizon. Those were the lights of Tersira Island, which were visible over a distance of about 100 miles away. Knowing the destination was in sight, strengthened their resolve. Air traffic controllers at Lages, using radars, guided the powerless jet towards the airfield. They repeatedly flashed the airfield's runway light on and off, trying to help the pilots orient themselves to the runway's location. Roughly around 5 minutes later, that's around 0631 UTC, Transat 236 made contact with Lages air traffic control and was cleared for a straightened approach runway 33. The Airbus 330 was still too high and fast, and even in a glide, it had excess energy. To bleed off altitude, Captain Pitch executed a 360 degree turn and a series of sharp is turns on the way down. With no flaps or spoilers available, actually most of them were inoperative due to non-availability of engine power. He used creative banking maneuver which is addressed as side slip in aviation to increase drag. On final approach, the flight attendants yelled the brace command and the passengers got into their respective positions. The huge A330 came in hot and heavy, roughly around 200 knots which is about 370 km per hour. In general, the approach speed of any big jet is around 145 knots, which is roughly about 270 km per hour. At a 0645 UTC, with no engines, Captain Pitch managed an astonishing landing. The first impact was hard, about 1030 feet from the runway threshold, causing the jet to bounce back into the air. Captain Pitch held it steady as it slammed down again at around 2800 feet down the runway. He immediately jammed on the brakes. The plane's anti-skid system was inoperative, so the wheels locked up. Tires screeched and disintegrated, rims sparking on the runway, the aircraft decelerated violently. After around 7,600 foot ground roll, Air Transat 236 finally came to a halt with about 2,400 feet of the runway to spare. Captain Pitch wasted no time and commanded an emergency evacuation. Slides deployed and passengers streamed out onto the tarmac. Shaken but alive, all 306 souls on board survived. The final investigation report identified multiple causes and contributing factors. It faulted the maintenance planning and quality control that allowed the mismatched parts to be installed. It also highlighted the crew's decision making. The crew failed to recognize the fuel leak in time and inadvertently worsened it by performing the fuel imbalance procedure from memory. Because they did not consult the checklist, they missed the caution that might have alerted them to a leak. In fact, no fuel leak procedure was initiated at all during the entire flight, a critical missed opportunity to mitigate the loss of fuel. Despite all these findings, public opinion hailed captain and the first officer as heroes for saving everyone on board. So that's all for today guys. Do drop in your thoughts and opinions in the comment section and do let me know how you would have handled the situation. If you like my content, do like, share, comment and subscribe. I'll see you all in the next one. Till then, God bless. Bye-bye.